Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the second event in Emily Bell's Humanitas Professorship of Media um, uh, this year. Um, before I start, I would like to say that we'd like to express our thanks to the uh, Wiedenfeld Hoffman Trust and the Blavatnik Family Foundation, who are the organizations which fund uh, this Humanitas series of, of professorships and which enable us to bring really interesting people like Emily and a lot of other people uh, to Cambridge. Now, um, this is the second event in, in, in Emily's professorship. There is uh, tomorrow in Crash, there will be a symposium in the afternoon to discuss some of the ideas she essayed in her lecture last night. Um, and if you'd like to come to that, please do, but it, it would help us if you, if you registered on the site so that we know how many people to expect. This evening, we have a public conversation between two very distinguished and interesting women. Uh, Emily Bell, uh, our current uh, professor, is a, form, for, a former colleague of mine on The Observer and The Guardian, um, who having, having masterminded, I think is the correct phrase, perhaps mistress-minded, the, um, the Guardian's transition from a, a, an honorable but little known uh, liberal British newspaper into a global media brand. Um, but she then moved over to, the, to Columbia University Journalism School, the best journalism school in the United States, to become the founding director of the Tao Center for Digital Journalism. Um, she was educated uh, at the other place uh, and born in, in, and born in, in Norfolk. Um, uh, and I, I leave you to ponder the implications of that. Um, now, our second uh, conversationalist today, uh, it needs no introduction, I think, although I once said in introducing Professor Arnold Kettle many years ago that he was a household name and he never spoke to me again. So I'm not going to make that mistake with Mary. Um, Mary is, is, is a force of nature. She is a professor of classics at the university here. She's a fellow of Newnham College and a Royal Academy of Arts professor of ancient literature. She's also, as many of you will know, the classics editor of the Times Literary Supplement and author of one of the best blogs in Britain, A Dawn's Life, which appears in the Times as a regular column. She's the author of numerous books and articles, including Pompeii, Life of a Roman Town, which won the Wilson Prize for History. And currently it's impossible to, to go into Heifers and Escape without buying a copy of her new book, SPQR, um, a, a massive and extremely impressive um, volume. She's a fellow of the British Academy and a regular contributor to both radio and television. Her frequent media appearances and sometimes controversial public statements have led her to being described as Britain's best non-classicist. I would prefer to describe her as Britain's best public intellectual. Uh, when I'm, I'm chairing this session, I, when I, I asked for advice about how to do it, and one of my wiser friends uh, pointed me towards the directions that you <laughs> find on boxes of fireworks, which say light blue touch paper and retire, which is what I'm proposing to do. Um, but I want to kick off by, by, by putting a question to the two of them, which is this. Um, one way of looking at the internet is to say that it is uh, a, a mirror to human nature. Um, it used to be said of the, of the news of the world, for example, one of its slogans was, all human life is here. It wasn't true of the news of the world, it was only dodgy vicars and bent policemen. But in the case of the internet, all human life really is there. Uh, and, and the network provides us with an interesting uh, reflection of that wide range of human nature. And what we see in that mirror is often not flattering. Uh, it, it's a very strange, what, the, the conclusion you draw from studying the behavior of people on the internet is that human nature is very strange indeed. Um, and the people who experience that uh, most, I think, are prominent and outspoken women. Um, and I'd like to start with that as a, as a, is that an accurate description of the net, ladies? Or not? What do you think? Mary? Oh, are you switched on? Um, we have to now have to start talking. Um, I, I mean, I think that is one way of putting it. Uh, and I mean, it gives me a certain kind of sympathy for the internet, actually. Because, I mean, I suppose one thing that the kind of run-ins I've had with it 
um, and with you know, particularly vicious trolling in some respect. I mean, I think it was an extremely interesting learning experience for me, and it showed me what a sheltered life I lived in, you know, in Cambridge and you know amongst like-minded people. You know, it showed me what people were really saying if you went into the you know into the the bit of the bar you don't usually go into at eleven o'clock on a Friday night. Uh, you know, I thought you know I didn't realise that kind of there were blokes mostly who said that kind of stuff any longer. Right. I, I mean, if you'd pressed me, I suppose I would have admitted that. But, whoops, um, I'd, you know, I think we're very tribal and we tend to talk to people that we know and who, even if we disagree strongly with, we, we agree on some basic bits of... I, I don't have many friends who think that women shouldn't go out to work. No? Uh, or right. if they do think that... When yep. they're talking to me, they don't say that. <laughs> right? Not say it to your face. Um, yep. So I, I, I found it quite interesting. I thought, you know, heavens, you know, wake up, be it a bit. Yeah. You know, or, you know, you've got to realise that that actually this world has got many more different shades of opinion right. than you imagine. And I'll just say one thing I'm looking for. Uh, also, t- just because I want to kind of get this in as a marker, um, I think that's why, in some ways, I'm kind of slightly more sympathetic than some women are to the idea that people say rude, insulting, ill-advised things on the web uh, or in whatever particular form of the media we're talking about. Because I think if you say all of human life is there, it is, and it's people being nasty, people making mistakes, uh, you know, and we're not going to have a world in which everybody somehow is really like themselves, except when they get online, they're polite. You know, that's never going to happen. No, I think that's... So I was responsible at The Guardian for, um, according to some of our best journalists, probably one of the most heinous um, decisions, which was to open comments um, and to actually sort of put our commentators, you know, into a discourse with um, the public. (laughs) And actually sort of two things happened, one of which was I think that we learned a lot because you you, you open the, the... doors to, as you say, a society which is not people in Islington who really love you. Uh, And a lot of our uh, columnists were under the impression that the world was full of people in Islington who really loved them. Um, And uh, that, so so two things struck me, one of which was that, you know, when when you hit certain hot button issues, and uh, for instance, if you're writing about sort of politics in Israel and Palestine, (laughs) It would, you know, we we would never post those pieces at, you know, five o'clock on Friday night and then go to the pub, because it was like, and, and somebody said it's like it's like lighting a fire and then walking off. But also the other thing was, I, it made me think quite hard just about how we set the tone of public debate. And sometimes I remember I remember uh, being mauled in morning conference at the Guardian by a columnist who had a particularly sort of ferocious to and fro in the comments beneath their piece. And they said, well, this is not, you know, these people are not our readers. They don't want it. They, they want to destroy us. They're, saying they, they're rude. They're, they're, they're. And on the f- front of the Guardian that day, we actually had right, not even a headline, but what they call the masthead right at the top. Um, we'd got a picture of Boris Johnson, who's not a person I, you know, particularly sort of warm to, um, but we'd said something like, you know, uh, Boris, colon, and then used a series of sort of adjectives about him that you would certainly never have gone up and, and said to, to a person, like sort of bully, racist, something, something. And I wonder what you said about that, because, you know, just that sort of your... We were just talking about how approachable you are as a person, which allows... And, and that per, your personality sort of carries with you into your broadcasting, into your online pay persona. Um, and so you, you kind of do, I wouldn't say you're inviting trolling, but you invite certainly sort of engagement. Well. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's, there's a whole spectrum of responses that you have to this. I mean, I, I wonder now how many people who write comment pieces, imagining them as print comment pieces, but they're online and so they're open to comment. Um, I wonder how many of those writers now have continued to engage with the 
commenters underneath the line. Because the, the, you know, the thing that you, you hear when you talk about, when people moan about um, the kind of under the under the line world in a newspaper. Yes, below the line. You know, below the line. <laughs> below <laughs> the line, under the line. <laughs> um, you'll hear lots of people say, oh, I never read that. You know, one thing I know, I, you know, that, but I never read what's, you know, I never read what they say, it's just awful, I never read it. And you think, well, look, actually, there's a funny replication going on of the sort of, um, of the, the power structures about who has a right to a voice that the internet somehow claimed it was going to undermine. You know, so uh, if what we get is um, a load of, uh, you know, nice Islington or Cambridge writers, you know, talking nice Cambridge Islington style and never reading the guys underneath who was uh, you fucking idiot, you don't understand, etc. Then or, or we're back to where we started. Right. And yet, if you... What I find is that I try... I don't... I do try to read. You have to sometimes, you know, have to have a very yes. large gin and tonic to do Very this. large, maybe two. Yeah. Go sometimes. through this. And um, when, when they seem as if they're actually trying to argue with me rather than abuse, mm. I, will tr- I will comment. I will, I will join the discussion. And when they've said something which is actually wrong, you know, when you say, you know, I do say, look, do read it again because I never said that. Right. And... I think it's quite interesting that about, I wouldn't say it was more than 50%, but about 50% of these people have come on very heavy. When you, when you actually respond, um, they're absolutely taken aback. Right. Because actually, they were sounding off about being angry. Now, and your article, whatever it was, was the prompt for that sounding off. But they, when they discover you're a person, mm. there's a kind of you know, reality check comes mm. in. And, you know, in many ways, I think that they're sort of victims of extraordinarily false claims for the democracy that online comment was going to bring, you know. And I think that's, that's pretty clear, you know, just in, um, you know, below the line comments. But I think it's very, very clear in Twitter, you know. So Twitter allows you to talk to the prime minister. You know, no, it doesn't. It allows you to be ignored by the Prime Minister's Twitter feed office, who are there, you know, saying, you know, happy Rosh Hashanah, you know, and any other religious festival that they can dig up, you know. And it even, I once went through some of these, David Cameron, um, Ed Miliband, twas then, Nick Cleggs, the little, and it said, you know, um, please do not expect a reply from this Twitter, you know, and if you actually really want to reply, please do not even send an email. I mean, be best writing a letter, you know, and you think, so here we are, we have, there's, there's a whole kind of set of uh, disguises and barriers, which, you know, no wonder people are angry, you know, right. here it says, here yes. I am, glorious Dave, and I'm talking to you about having a lovely, you know, Yom Kippur, or <laughs> who gets it all wrong, you know, or whatever, you know, wishing you, you know, this, this very important time, etc. and it's not Dave. Doing that? It's not Dave doing that. It's not Dave. It's, it's someone who looks a bit like Dave did 20 years ago, hoping that what well, shiny face person, hoping they will one day be prime minister too. You know, sometimes they get it wrong, like Diane Abbott's, you know, because it happens across the political spectrum. Let's be right. clear. You know, there's Diane Abbott's the eager Twitter person, you know, doing it during a two minute, one minute silence, you know. Oh, there's, but, but you, so, so, but you were using, so you were using kind of, sort of social media, I mean, you were blogging before Twitter um, came on the scene. So, Don, so Don's life started when, so 2007, six, 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 seven. Seven. yeah, yeah, which is really early, actually, for that sort of thing. Did you find that it sort of changed? Um, because, I, you know, I, I love the way in that, the, the, you know, even in the books, you include comments, you know, and you say that sort of occasionally somebody will point something out which is actually sort of helpful to you and sometimes they will respond in a way which is funny and sometimes they will respond in a way and as you say it it completely alters the balance of the book and it it also alters alters but you know your tone is always conversational I think always conversational Um, did you find that it altered sort of how you thought about your work did it did it it's been wonderful in all kinds of ways I mean I've been extremely lucky and I I wish I knew why I'd been lucky, and I think it is 
quite a lot to do with happenstance. You know, that I get this blog. I, when I start this blog, I had never read a blog. I didn't know what a blog was. And in fact, in the Times, they were still called weblogs. It was such a long they were. time ago. That's right. right. <laughs> yes, I could do the weblog. Um, and I, I, was, I wasn't exactly made to do it. I was, it was suggested to be a good idea. You know? And um, so that's I sort of did what I was told. And I, I thought it would be dead within six months. I didn't. You know, <laughs> I didn't, right. I didn't that's I, what we were all hoping at that time. Yeah, I had we no, I, to do things I, online. Yes, don't worry. Instinctively, I thought it was a very nasty form of done-down journalism, which I discovered it wasn't, actually. Um, that, that actually doing it on, online meant that you could talk about all kinds of things that you couldn't talk about and with links, etc. So I, I got to quite enjoy it. But by whatever reason, I the blog attracted a group of people who really entered into the spirit of it and, and enjoyed it. Um, and I've met some of them now because when, when we published some of these blogs and we published the, some of the comments, we had a party uh, and the, because I thought I was just ripping off the comments really, and we'd ask them for permission, but mm. the least they might do is get a party. So I had a party. So I met the people and there, of course, discovered that the demographic was, you know, well, they were, they were generally older than me. Generally older. Generally older That's than good. me. That's good, yes. Um, uh, and a lot I like of, it when that happens, yeah. incidentally. When I go into a room, I teach at university, okay. going into a room with people who are generally older than you yeah. is, uh, and, and they're not actually dying. Like, it's not a hospital. That's a treat, <laughs> no, I find. Treat. I really it's like that. And very interestingly, and I think there's a, I mean, John might be able to say something about this. Um, there were, a, a, I thought, a surprising number of expats in it. And yes. I thought, what we've got here is we've got, at that point, we've got um, an elderly demographic who've actually come into the, to the internet age because they're living in the south of France, their access to newspapers have become... So they were a very particular little niche market not all of them but that was right. the centre and I've got so much out of it I, 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 I have to make sure I don't abuse it you know because if I'm you know on the hunt for something I was trying to find uh, at one point a, a whole load of ceramics um, made to look like Roman emperors and I'd found some and I wanted some others so I'd post the one on the web and by the time you know by the time I put the blog up and gone back to it in two hours you know they were coming in and saying, oh, I think I know where another one is. Uh, and, right. And so it, it has been, the blog for me has been an almost wholly positive right. experience. But, uh, but it's a very, I suspect it's a, a particular niche because I, I don't think that most online commenters in the world are 70 year olds living outside CAM. But this, <laughs> but this, I mean, this sort of exercise. Also, so one of the things I've I've read you talking about, um, and you know, the, the, so 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 I've been very interested in how diversity is reflected online. So you do tend to find that sort of underrepresented people who are underrepresented in the mainstream media have been very active on social platforms. So uh, certainly, sort of early Twitter. Uh, was predominantly not necessarily sort of women who were using it, but so, well, so, sorry, not there were as many men using Twitter as, as women, but the women far more act, active. Yeah. Um, you know, the black Twitter in the States, yeah. uh, hashtag black Twitter, is a huge thing, and these, the, these are voices which just didn't find an expression um, in the mainstream. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a whole, I was saying to John, um, I'm not necessarily including you in this because you're not angry, but there's a whole community of, you know, older women who are in some way sort of working in similar spheres, who have lots to say, yeah. who actually form a sort of community, yeah. whereas I'm fairly sure all of us would now be on the cutting room floor of some newspaper or another yeah. and told yeah. that we have to move on. Yeah. Um, and that sort of construction of a new, new spheres is, is, is interesting because, you know, you, you know, you, when you, how, do, how does that sense? You're a classicist with the, sort of the, the historic creation of, sort of public discourse and discussion, because it has always been men who are in charge, and they're still really in charge of the platforms. I mean, they're still. Yeah, still I mean, that's. I mean, I think it's. I'm quite interested in, in what really the power of these apparently disempowered groups 
you know, is on Twitter. That goes back to the Cameron case. You know, that it's, it's actually, well, okay, so you know, uh, uh, let me, you know, us discontented, late career female academics. No, we can, yeah, there's, we, a lot, there's a lot of us. <laughs> we can feel a lot better um, because, yeah, yeah. you know, we follow each other on Twitter and we can say, God, isn't that terrible? And, you know, and I'm not knocking feeling a lot better. I think that's, you know, that's... You, you meet people, you know, and, you, and, you, and you meet people. It's great to go on a train and say, "I think I follow you on Twitter." And you think, you know, and you know, I, I positively like that. Whether it really operates as a springboard for getting women's voices into the public sphere, I'm a bit doubtful about. It can't be hurting, but I, I'm, I'm not. You think that, they, that that is a so, well? It, it was interesting actually. At Columbia, we had a um, uh, we had a conference um, at the end of last year about journalism and Silicon Valley. Because I mean, part of, sort of my theme this week is really about how we're all being subsumed now in these much greater sort of power structures, um, all of which are sort of ge geographically pretty specific to the Pacific Northwest and Northern California. Um, in the States, and all of which are actually culturally really specific. So if you go and walk around these companies, they are not, <laughs> they don't tend to be filled with people like you and I. Um, you don't go into really? Twitter and suddenly think I am the youngest person in the room. Uh, you know, that, 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 that it's a sort of, they are generally speaking young men um, in their 20s. They're generally speaking sort of from an engineering background. Uh, and for them, life has been uh, pretty good. And they're um, not black. Sorry, and they're, and they're not black. No, and they are not black. Um, and the, the, but they're building products that we are using yeah. and that sort of sh shape that. And as you say, so those sort of controls, does it matter if we have, as you say, so, so what's the leap that we have to make that takes us from the consumer and the sort of activist into actually sort of the realm of power? Because I'm a great believer in representation. I think you have done huge amounts by being on the telly, engaging with people on issues like age uh, and feminism um, in a popular context, which actually hasn't happened for years and years and years. I mean, you know, I saw some young women the other day saying, imagine I'm 50 now. There hasn't been the female president of the United States. That's a big shock yeah. to the 18 year old me. Yeah. That yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think the the difficulty is from the outside. I mean, I haven't, I haven't that characterization has been wonderfully interesting. I now have a kind of view of what I might find if I went to Twitter HQ. I think you should. I'm going to, um, I'm going to yeah. take you to Twitter <laughs> HQ and um, it but would be an interesting anthropological experiment. It's the question really, isn't it, of how, I mean, there's the power of the company forming the ways in which we can talk, yes. actually, with other forms of institutional power with which presumably at some level they join up. Yes. And that's where, you know, it's hard to know in what way they join up, um, but the, the, the basic um, power structure of um, the West, let's say, um, as being um, young looking white and male, um, not necessarily young, but young looking white and male, uh, is replicated at each point of control over social media. And that, you know, that's where I feel, and it goes back to, um, you know, understanding the sort of anger of people who, whose only voice appears to be social media and, you know, having however many Twitter followers or, you know, being able to put things out on their Facebook page or whatever. But, you know, they're not stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, they know that actually they're not where the power lies. Right. And, uh, you know, and, okay, we can all point to you know, individual uh, instances of something going viral on Twitter that either does or doesn't make a difference. And usually they don't make a difference. It's someone's cat doing something stupid, you know, which adds <laughs> not a jot to um, the, you know, the world of political change. Right. But very occasionally there, you know, there are. It's, it's, you, you couldn't... Uh, it would be too negative to say that that, that social media, and I'm sure if we looked at the Arab Spring, we'd find a bit of this, they're probably not as much as we mm. thought. You know, the, well, the social media revolution. But all the same, ultimately, this is... I, I, I think I would think that this is only 
a superficially democratising force? It's, I mean, I think that this is such an interesting and central question. So again, I have students who have um, come from the Middle East who are, their facility, first of all, uh, I had a great, I was saying last night, that I had a, my first lecture of the year is to the incoming class of 250 students at Columbia Journalism School. And we have a school now which is 40% international. And uh, whilst we're all wringing our hands and saying, oh, you know, there's too much nonsense on the web, you know, journalism is dying, it's all awful. Wasn't it so much better when you just got your New Yorker once a week and the Times arrived and it was ironed for you by your butler? That was all so much better. And actually, for half of my students, their experience is this has changed their lives um, politically. It's changed their outcomes. Um, and I, so the first lecture of the year, I said, so how many people have Snapchat here? And they're very reluctant to raise their hands. So there's about 15 of them put their hands up. And I went, oh, come on. Who has Snapchat on their phone? You know, a few more. So I said, you have to put Snapchat on your phone. And they would, the apps, and one of them actually said, excuse me, um, I did not come to Columbia University to be taught how to use Snapchat. And I said, well, unfortunately, you are in my class, so <laughs> welcome to Columbia. Um, and at the end of the lecture, a young chap came up to me who was from Saudi Arabia. And he said, can I just show you something? And he had a Snapchat channel on which he has 15,000 followers. And he'd been using it to report bits of um, the conflict on the border with Yemen. And he said, I'm now being asked by CNN to train their correspondents in the area to, to, to use this. Um, and it, so sometimes I think we have that sort of Amerocentric, as we call it, also Western view yeah. Yeah. of abundance yeah. where, and where none, where none exists. It's suddenly this sort of, again, empowering. Yeah. Yeah. But the Arab Spring, as you say, is a classic case of, okay, so that was great. Social, that was a wonderful that revolution was great. That's what happened. That, that, that was great. And well now, and, and we build, but, but this is, I mean, this is really sort of come down, comes down to the who, who decides, right? Yeah. Because we now have. Uh, ISIS, um, yeah, yeah. who are using the same tools yeah. in a completely yeah. different way. And there's lots of paradoxes in here, because it would also be true, you know, if I, I'm, I, you know, I, could, I could talk the talk about how, you know, in the end, your Twitter campaign, thinking, let's think of the West here, and, and, and do think it must be different elsewhere, um, isn't actually, you know, this, this, isn't, this isn't bringing you power. On the other hand, it would be disempowering not to be part of you know, right. So, so there's a kind of paradox mm. that, that, that so it's it's push it's pushing you into much more kind of complicated set of decisions about where you find a space to to talk. And yet, in the end, and I, I you know, I, I, so however horrible, you know, they, you know, some of these guys were in wherever they sat in their basements with their laptops were really vile about me, but. It, you know, on the, on the worst occasion, it came after I was on Question Time. Right. And actually, it is the case that they're, you know, from their point of view, you know, if you look at those big TV uh, supposedly opinion-forming places, now, the, the way in which they form opinion might be grossly exaggerated, and, uh, and I think that's probably true, but they sit down at 10.30 on a Thursday night, and it's still the same old people talking at them on the telly, in which, and although, you know, there's a whole way in which, you know, everybody is sitting at home, quite interestingly, I think, you know, tweeting about, God, what hopeless things she just said, etc. There is a, it is allowing much more cross-household communication about that. In the end, if you say, look, at one level, and it's only one marker of power and influence, you know, who is on BBC radio and telly is not the people, mostly not the people who are running Twitter campaigns. Right. Or active. Now, there are, we know also there are exceptions to that. And you could think of something like Mumsnet, right. which was, you know, so n none of these things are absolutely universal, but I'm mm. certain that uh, it's, there's a huge feeling of frustration that you think you've got, you think you're talking to the world, uh, but you're not. And it's the same old people talking to the world. It may be different to say, you know, I'm not sure that you know, Twitter's Arab Spring, if it was Twitter, could be put down as a great success. But. No, no, it though, certainly changed. No, no though, it again, sort of, you know, it's interesting that sort of these, as, as somebody who's as 
student of Middle East, uh, an academic who studied Middle Eastern politics once said to me, which is absolutely true, so said that maybe also our perception of, of how revolutions happen, certainly not yours because you know about these things, but our perceptions of how revolutions happen are also distorted that they don't actually sort of, there isn't a great uprising and then the next day <laughs> there's, there's regime change and then yes. everybody lives happily ever after. <laughs> these, these can be, you yes. know, and, and again, sort of when you look at something like Black Lives Matter in the States and what happened in the last year in Ferguson and in Baltimore and even on the streets of New York, um, you know, the civil rights movement in America took sort of between abolition, you know, in the late 60s. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's you know, you're talking about 100 years of yeah. sort of, of, of yeah. people, uh, you know, of, a, of a protracted struggle. And I think that you're, you've, you're caught between, as you say, the ease of discourse making you think that change is going to be eased in the same way. Yeah without a sort of a perspective, but also the perspective that, that change is often incremental and this yeah, may, be con yes. may be contributing to it, but we don't, yes, yes. But we don't know. But yes. the point yes. being that the power brokers are still yes. principally the same. Yes. And you follow your friends. And, and so right. certainly on Twitter, you, you can easily get a sense that you're in a much bigger group than you are. Yes, and there's polarity of yeah. discourse yeah. as well. Yeah. What would we do? So, so Mary, you've got sort of experience of um, thinking about how um, ancient civilizations created f different ways of mm -hmm. thinking about discourse and democracy, etc. Mm -hmm. So, if you were, I would love it. I would love it if you were, in fact, chief executive of Facebook um, <laughs> or, or indeed Twitter. If what are the kind of things that that because I do think that these companies haven't really thought about what scaling discourse means mm -hmm. uh, and the, and so they're sort of caught in this binary of open it up shut it down what are the what are the sort of lessons we can take from history and say think about this when you're designing your next set of products oh so i think that's quite a, if you, from from my bit of history you mm. know i don't know what it looks like with the, you know, we were to talk about the early modern pamphlet revolution i don't know how right. that would feel um uh, I think my bit of history would give them some quite important counter-examples. You know, because um, you, know, you can walk through the streets of Pompeii and you can see, I suppose, what the ancient equivalent of social media, loads and loads of graffiti. It's yep. a town in which is whatever the level of literacy is communicating to itself in you know, not much more than 140 characters, frankly, in most uh, scratches that are up there. Um, and you see it being almost entirely male, and you see it being um, strongly sexually insulting. Um, you see it in that case being anonymous. Um, and then you think, you know, so you think, when I look at that, I think, is that like social media now? Or is it quite different? Right. Like male, <laughs> anonymous, 140 characters. Um, you know, I think it's a nice lesson that people. Uh, uh, people, we, you know, the one thing I don't want to get out of social media, mm. I don't want us all to be polite. Right. Know? And I think, you know, I, you know, I work in uh, an intellectual, well, an academic field uh, where um, things that would, you know, be close to <laughs> having people arrested and put in the nick uh, are happily written on walls. Um, and I think it's, a, you know, there's, a, there's quite a salutary message there. But otherwise, it, it is, you know, you'd say, you know, what is it that would enable us to have a set of uh, social media that didn't, that weren't rooted in that? What, you know, what would we need to have it different? And at that point, it's very hard mm. to know because, you know, it isn't, it isn't the fault of these young men. No, no. twenty something. They're just doing what young men have always done in controlling the world. Um, so how? Uh, but, uh, it's just they have a kind of they have a better alibi now than they used to. Right. Really? Because the social media, uh, you know, isn't it is in some sense as a substitute for a wide democratisation. I think. But what would you? How would we change it? Could, what, could, what would you do to change it? Could, could I just in, uh, just interject for a second, following that up? Um, Emily, when you were making decisions about commenting yeah. on the Guardian sites, yeah. 
um, the, there must have been an argument, and I think there was an argument, about whether or not you should allow anonymous commenting, or whether you should uh, ensure that people, if they want to comment, they had to own their comments, as it were, with their own names. And the decision was made not to require yes. people to use yes. their real names. That's right. Um, I was a great proponent of anonymity, um, because I felt that, uh, first of all, um, part of journalism is all about protecting your sources. Now, there was an argument within journalism that says you should allow, you, should, you shouldn't have anonymous sources, you shouldn't allow people to be quoted anonymously, that you should always tie, uh, tie, their, tie their names. I mean, two things. First of all, um, quite a lot of the comments that we would get uh, and I, I would say that these were more than the comments that caused us problems, but quite a lot of the comments that we would get would be from people who were talking from a point of view of personal experience about something which was uh, clearly not something that they would ever want tied to their real name. You know, they don't want discussions about their sexuality, they don't want discussions yes. about their mental health, yes. they don't want discussions about workplace bullying, they don't want discussions about their families, they don't want any of that tied yes. to. And I sort of, don't forget this is actually pre-social media in a way. Yes. So what we found was that sort of in, in some of our communities, and not necessarily, you know, the Communist is three sort of really big kind of, you know, political debates of the day, but somewhere buried in the sort of the family, you know, kind of pages thread, you would actually get the most extraordinary conversations mm. from people who didn't have an outlet, you know, and, and I, I think that sort of this idea of giving voice to the powerless, uh, we've seen with Facebook that if you require, nobody, ha and this is the other thing, nobody has one identity. You know, Mary and I and you, we have one identity when we're here. I will have another identity when I'm talking to my mother. Um, I will have another identity, sort of, you know, when I'm talking to my kids, I'll have another identity when I'm talking to my friends. And they're all sort of more or less linked, but there are bits of my life where I wouldn't want, I'm not going to have a conversation with my students yeah. that I would necessarily have with my husband. And no. I think that's fine, and I've, I've in a sense, quite internalised that justification. You know, and I think it's a, it's right. a strong justification. Nevertheless, when I'm in a conversation um, online and I'm Mary Beard and I'm talking with Scary Cornflake, I don't feel that this is no. a conversation which is a, a conversation of equilibrium. Right. You know? I think, so you know who I am. I don't know who yes. you are. Um, and you've got a silly little name, which is actually both a protection, mm. but it's also an affront to me because I'm sitting here and I'm, you know, I'm going to say, I'm Mary Beard and I'm happy to engage with you, but you're not telling me who you are. So I think the bit that I, I was always sort of slightly at variance on is that I just wouldn't have engaged. I just don't engage. It's like, okay, so, so there's a point at which I think if you don't want to be reasonable and you're not going to tell me who you are, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to talk to you. It's like, it's like, it's like, why would you, you wouldn't do that in a, and, and I've become, I, I sort of think, but, but I think the bit that I got wrong probably when we were designing this is just that, as you say, actually what you're doing is you're asking people, so, you know, you know, you're on the telly, and we were talking about this earlier, that, you know, actually part of the requirement in a way of your job now as a journalist or as a broadcaster, sometimes even as an academic, is to actually yeah. get out there and talk to people. I so think we, it's, we have classes here, I think. I think for how to use social media more do you have classes? I think Cambridge, so. Cambridge University have I believe classes for your academics. I think to... it does. I think I've had something coming around saying using social media to get your research out there. Wow. I think just do it, for God's sake. Just do the fucking stuff. <laughs> yes, I was going to say, just open a Twitter <laughs> account it. and start yes. tweeting. Yes. You don't it's really like, need to... You don't, don't oh, actually, but this, I mean, but this is interesting because, again, you know, kind of you were an early adopter, I was an early adopter. In a way, I think that sort of early phase you're allowed to... to, to I mean, what I find with students, which is absolutely yeah. fascinating for journalism students, is that many of them, don't, they're all using social media, none of them are using it professionally. Lots and lots and lots of them, for instance, don't use Twitter because... They've suddenly understood that something that you put out there, you have no control over. So, you know, it's, a, it's, like, it's like when you when you write a story, when you say something on television these days, it is like pulling a pin on a grenade and rolling it sort of with your eyes shut, really, because you don't know whether it's going to hit the target. You don't know if it's going to la land in the sort of, you know, go, go over the edge and sort of, you know, not explode. Um, and sometimes it's going to, you know, end up in a pool of petrol. And, and you can't... You know, everything you put out there has potentially the equal reach to something on the front page of the New York Times, something on the Today programme, something on 6 o'clock news. 
And it's that, I think, scares people from engaging or being out there. And I wonder whether, again, we've made the sort of, it, it's a bit like sort of, you know, the, the, by journalists going on and on about sort of like the, the, the terrible sort of bear pit that social media is, it's generally sort of made people find, find, feel a little scarce. And when my students go out there and they actually start using it professionally, um, they uh, are quite surprised that really nobody is looking at what they do. <laughs> <laughs> they sort of They're like, also, oh, the truth is, also, most people are quite nice on Twitter. Most actually. people are quite nice. But, you know, yes. if, if I, you know, I've probably had um, a, a rougher time than many people, but still the balance comes out as more people are really nice, actually, and they comment responsibly, they occasionally make stupid mistakes, yes. um, or they misunderstand, and 140 characters is not very good for getting nuance across. You know, it's not very good. It's not. It's not very good for getting nuance across. And it's like when you said. I mean, again, when you said people make mistakes, the other thing which is interesting is the permanence of it. You know, it's just sort of um, so one of the one of the, if you like, kind of intellectual struggles I've had thinking about this is what do we do with the archive? Because as a journalist, you want the archive preserving. Um, and actually, as an individual, you don't really want the archive preserving. You want to be able to say, so when, so, you know, anonymous comments, say, for instance, anon anonymous commenting is something now which will be tied to your, you know, if you had your real identity, yeah. it's tied to you, sort of, yeah. something that you said when you were 16 might still be tied to you when yeah. you're 36. Um, uh, and it, it, this whole idea of having everything about yourself following you around forever, uh, and findable and discoverable is, is a new concept to us. You know, we haven't actually lived I, with that for I very long. I expect we'll learn to take it with the pinch of salt it deserves. You know, I think, that would be nice. I think, you know, right yes. now, you know, you know what happens. You know, people, um, you know, people are going for jobs. You know that the interview panel Googles yes. them and discovers, you know, a rather stupid <laughs> photograph they took when they were 16, you know, and they think, oh, you know, is that the kind of person we want working for our company? Well, sooner or later, sure. they will discover that there's something, you know, there's a nasty yes. secret about everybody. We will, we will actually start, you know, to pay no more attention to that than if we'd been given right. um, the poor job applicant's 16-year-old diary, you know. And I, I, I think... Th I think time will help us just get a bit sensible. Yes, conventions. It. We have great. If we have faith in humanity, it's, to, it's yeah. that we create our own conventions yes. and sort of again societies, really, yeah. many yeah. communities. And I mean, I, I do. Th I feel in a very different generation from some young people now, who, but only mm. it's only very recent that people have grown up thinking. Of, actually internalising some conventions about social media. You know, nobody else was ever taught about this at school. I mean, mm. I remember at school, that, you know, we spent a whole lesson learning how to write a telegram. You know, <laughs> That's like, very good. You know, <laughs> and, you know, how you were going to get it to, to save as much money. It was no different, really, from Twitter. Right. Just, you know, but how you were going to put, you know... Please send to, help. help. Stop. <laughs> you know, and how, when you put the stop in and not, you know. And, you know, now there are all these kind of old fusties who say, do you know, there are people learning in English classes, they're learning about how to write tweets. And I thought, well, it was no different than me learning about how to write a telegram, was it? I mean, <laughs> um, and, you know, even down to, you, you know, you sense people's idea is still very fluid even about email you know the, you know you know, you know when you write a letter because we were all taught it you put the address at the top right corner you put dear so and so yes. and then you learn when to put yours sincerely or yours yes. faithfully and then you have your students saying hi mary and you think no <laughs> you know Smile, you know? yes and then, and then all they put dear professor you think crawler you know <laughs> um, so you know it's very hard to, to get it right it's hard to get it right smiley faces i don't send smiley faces back to uh, and, students or sometimes sad faces and occasionally disappointed or puzzled faces kisses. But, uh, yes yeah. the number of bloody kisses that people put in emails that they would never put if they were writing oh, so, a letter you know so now, i rather like the <laughs> passive aggressive kiss at the bottom of an email where somebody sends you some terrible sort of like could you just do this appalling piece of administration yes. that you're really really and then you go I'm really sorry I must have missed this somehow I'll get onto it right away and then a very small kiss right at the bottom which you, and you imagine yeah, as they nice. open it they go yes. Yes. No, that is worse than the I'm terribly sorry I've 
I, I'm terribly sorry, Miss your, your supervision. I was, you know, I was, you know, I, I don't know what came in, but I wasn't feeling very well. You know, love Cressida, kiss, 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 kiss. And you think, no fucking, no, don't, 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 don't send me, <laughs> do not no send kisses. me fucking kisses when you have missed my, like, your yes, supervision. Yes, 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 that's right. That should just that's be an it. automatic yes. bounce back to yes. all students. But I think that actually I'm rather confident about the British education system and English teachers. I'm sure that out there now there are people who are learning how to write. Just a simple email. A simple email to your professor when you have yes. missed their class. Yes. And it's probably best not to say I wasn't feeling very well. No, that's right. I think neither am I. Neither am I. I never feel very well. <laughs> Whenever I see students, I feel slightly poorly. So it's actually, that's not true. They're a joy and a delight. Um, but the other thing, actually, just sort of touch on sort of one, one thing, which is, I think, really interesting. It's very relevant to universities uh, at the moment. It's particularly sort of, you know, I think an issue in the States and increasingly here, um, which is the sort of the no platforming. Um, so, so one of the things I wonder about the effect of uh, sanitization of discourse. So one of the things that, as you say, what you don't want to do is you don't want people to just be polite everywhere. And one of the things that um, I worry about when I look at the, the, the kind of thinking that's going into how should Facebook sort of keep, you know, conversations. It's like everything. Uh, it's almost like the everything is awesome world. Um, and then you have, you know, sort of Twitter saying, right, okay, we're really going to start um, flexing our muscles on trust and safety. Uh, and it sort of sometimes can, can play into, you know, real life spaces where, you know, in universities, people are saying, well, you know, we have a right to be protected from offence. Uh, which is a very um, new uh, and, and, and difficult, uh, I think, line to negotiate. Um, I, don't, I don't know sort of whether... And, and to, to me, but some of that feels as though it comes from a sort of the moderation culture. Mm. Of and it, it, comes from, it comes from a combination of that kind of moderation culture and also a whole generation that's been built, brought up with safety being a mantra in a way that it yes. wasn't right. to us that you know you know that about whether you were safe on the school trip you know whether you know how many people yes. were allowed in the boat you know now okay i think health and safety could be knocked too far you know you know i don't yes. want people falling off ladders or people drowning you know because nobody's cared about health and safety but it's there's a discourse of of safety which yes. you know it, it's very very odd i think to you know to be someone who feels quite old, of a, of a sort of an older generation who is really keen on risk, you know? And yes. somehow the whole world seems <laughs> sort of it's turned upside down. Right. That, and, and I always thought, and I, of course there are difficult boundaries here. Of course there are difficult boundaries. And anybody who thinks that they can draw an easy one between free speech and hate speech, yes. now, that's the problem, isn't it? And yes. And there's no simple answer to that. Well, that's but I think that the world of ideas is our most dangerous and worrisome and uncomfortable sometimes place, and so it jolly well should be. And you, I, you know, you don't I, don't. I wouldn't say that anybody has a right to offend anybody else, but conversely, I wouldn't say that anyone has a right not to be offended. Right, and I think that that's, and as you say, sort of drawing the lines between what is hate speech, uh, what makes people feel unsafe in their own homes or on their own streets. Uh, and words are powerful, you know, words are powerful, but, but drawing a line between that and an inability to discuss ideas which you don't like or make you uncomfortable. I think it's interesting that in the States at the moment, one of the things which is sort of apparently indexing high when people talk to uh, Republican voters about why they're favoring Donald Trump um, is because he is, you know, the, the, the thing that sort of apparently crops up, there was a poll a couple of days ago saying that um, it's people that are very sort of, a, a particular a, a certain demographic, are very upset about what they call political correctness. I'm, I, in some ways, I'm a sort of a fan of political correctness because I think it flags how we make progress as a society. Yeah. That actually kind of, you know, um, and, and it tends to be, the powerful oppressing the weaker or minorities with 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 speech and and, and diminishment mm -hmm. and insult, um, but clearly you know the older white yeah. men who are yes, mostly voting for Donald Trump. Yeah 
do feel disempowered, as somebody said, well, you've, you know, you've had a, a, a black president for eight years and you might be about to get a woman president mm -hmm. for eight years, which if you're a Texan male age 60 on the right of the GOP is your idea of an absolute yeah. nightmare. And that's presumably part of the appeal of both Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson. But yes. I think we, I mean, the other side of the... Seems to say that it's not a bad thing that these people are never going to get elected. Does it? it seems like and a it, very good thing to me. And it may not be a, a bad thing that they're there so long right. as they're not elected. I mean, I think that's, right. you know, I think there are many different roles to fulfill in a, in a, in a yes. productive political society. And right. as long as we don't have Boris as prime minister, he might yes. be a good thing to have there. But I, I think we often tend to forget when we're thinking about this, we tend to forget what was hugely controversial, I can't remember how long it was ago now, when Nick Griffin went on Question Time. Yeah. And, you know, the, the whole stuff about how you shouldn't have, you know, the BNP should not be represented in British mainstream media. Uh, you know, actually, he was shown up, and his party was shown up to have nothing intelligent to say. Um, and it, in a sense, it finished the BMP. It was the yes. beginning of the end of the BMP. You know, and the idea of you know, no platforming Nick Griffin and letting him go on, um, you know, being that kind of bogeyman in the corner. Yeah. Actually, he was shown to be not only nasty, which he probably was, but he was particularly shown to be vacuous. Mm. Unfortunately, well, we're hoping the same thing will play out with Donald Trump in the States, but it hasn't, hasn't worked so far. Um, oh, put Bonnie Greer with him. She was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, I'd, I'd like to open this up now to, uh, to, to, to you. Um, we've got two mics. Uh, if you'd like to say something, it doesn't have to be a question. It could be an opinionated comment. Um, but please wait for, for, for a microphone to get to you. While the, while the microphone's going up there, I just want to ask us sort of on a kind of a, 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 a thumbs up, thumbs down basis. You know, you've been a, you've been an, 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 a female public intellectual, you know, who's had an increasingly high profile um, in your fifties, I guess. Is that right? Um, do you think that? Uh, I mean. Do you feel that things are getting better for women? I, you know, I say it's, it's, I think as you get older, you you feel I feel more I feel more feminist rage now than I probably did when I was twenty five. Not a fair bit then. I think it's possible to feel more feminist rage simultaneously to think that things are getting better. You know, I mean, anybody who had been in this university over the last what is um just over forty years. I mean. <laughs> You know, you know, when I was an undergraduate, 12% of, of students were women. Right. I mean, it was a man's world. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd go into classes still and people would say, oh, you have the ladies here, you know. Now, and actually, they weren't the worst offenders because those that were kind of quite overtly sexist were quite easy to deal with. It was right. the ones that were sexist in their heads. Yes. Difficult to deal with. Yes. You know, the liberals, yes. they were the worst, you know. Um, uh, you, you know, you still thought that women should be at home doing it. You know. um, or that women should have a totally different relationship with power. Yes. Which yes. is the same, yes, same thing. Right. So even if they thought yes. they were very pleased that you were there, yes. they were still yes, a right. little bit curious and about when, why you thought it was okay to And whenever say they used the word ambitious of a woman, it was not a compliment. <laughs> no, not a compliment. Hi. So I, I just had a really kind of quick, um, vague observation, which may manifest itself as a question. And I certainly hope will. Um, so I was just curious about what you were saying about Nigel Farage, Donald Trump, um, and, and Nick Griffin being given a platform in question time, um, and, and what you're saying about political correctness. I mean, my kind of impression of the Nick Griffin question time. I mean, I'm very far from. Sorry, can you hear can you me? Speak into the mic. Now, I'm, I'm very far from expressing any sympathy for Nick Griffin, but I think that kind of reinforces what I might be about to say in, in any case if I, I say that, that. I mean, my impression was he was not exactly given a fair hearing in the sense that, you know, everyone knew what he was going to say was kind of bollocks. And there was a great chance for the three other people to gang up on him and sort of have a laugh and to show that they weren't racist. And, you know, and he, but, you know, I agree, it completely demolished him. But to me, what it showed was kind of the strength of the BMP being mainstream taboo to kind of be able to quite safely dismiss them and gain popularity points for being so. And the difference between him and Nigel Farage, who was some 
you know, really quite reprehensible, you know, policies and opinions too, is that Nigel Farage kind of, he taps into a sort of annoyance at, at PC and political correctness without quite managing to step in and say something to boo. And he, even Donald Trump, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't say he doesn't say extremely politically incorrect things, but he steers clear of saying, you know, like something overtly, you know, very, very overtly racist. Oh, I'm not say. sure. I think saying that Mexicans are rapists and <laughs> villains, uh, and he's going to put, every time somebody says they aren't, he's going to put another 10 feet on the wall is, I mean, he's been very selectively racist, but he has been sort of, as it were, the ultimate racist bully by picking on, you know, particularly a sort of a minority group that he feels he can get other minor minorities to back him up in, in, in picking on. I mean, he has been, to me, he's been like a living embodiment of the producers. He's been saying the more and more and more outrageous things in the hope he doesn't actually have to give up his rather nice lifestyle and start being president, uh, which in America is a really shitty Not job, a really yeah. shitty job. Um, but I think he has been, I think he, uh, and I think that's what's shocked the sort of the political establishment, yeah. but also sort of made the media kind of, and again, social, so all of it's been conducted through social media, really. He's, he's had this constant running that with fuel, fueling sort of the debates. But it's a very interesting uh, exercise in when somebody just says something which is completely wrong all the time, not like provably, demonstrably lying. So when he said, after 9-11, people, there were thousands of Muslims in the streets of Newark, New Jersey, celebrating. Well, first of all, there aren't thousands of Muslims in the streets of New Jersey anyway. Secondly, they absolutely weren't celebrating. Thirdly, even the head of police said, this is made up. And people didn't care. People were like, I don't really care if this. And he said, oh, I don't, you know, I, you can say what you like. I know what I heard. And yeah, that's right. And in a much I, I, more anodyne form, it comes over, you know, to go to Boris, you yeah. know, Boris's complete uh, fabrications about EU reg regulations yes. Yes. is one of, you know, the, you know, EU regulation says that no child under eight can blow up a balloon, you know. Mm. <laughs> It's, you know, now it's actually it's, a rather anodyne version when you compare that to you know, Muslims yes. celebrating in the streets of New Jersey, but it, yes. it's on a spectrum. But it's also, it's, it sort of gives you a problem as, a, as, as journalists, which is do you cover things which are not true, which you know are not true, um, because it's free speech and this is person's a candidate and should you be giving it coverage, should, should you be giving this coverage, or should you be thinking this is actually factually incorrect? What we're doing is we're, we're contributing to, and, and it has led to sort of media being completely paralysed in the States between yeah. we just need yeah. to report what a candidate says versus saying actually some of this is not just contestable, it's completely wrong. Can I go back to, to Griffin? Because I think, I mean, in some ways, I, I mean, I see your point. I could, I could do the argument, I think, like you're going, which is that... You know, what what we had was not a debate. We had um, the British liberal establishment of whatever its political colour um, ganging up on a supposed outsider. Um, and I think that's true. Um, in the end, I, f I find myself not particularly bothered by it. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, in my heart of hearts, I'm not sad that that happened to Nick Griffin. Now, I, I, and I, you know, I can see, I can see the logic, and I can see there would be cases, instances where it would actually be much more damaging. And I think possibly, you know, if you were Nigel Farage, what you would say is that it was the British establishment's refusal to hear these things um, that have left us partly in some of the messes that we're now in. But you know, but in the end. Um, I'm not going to have a sleepless night. No. You know, I'm no. glad he went on there, and I'm glad he was shown to be an idiot. So I just wanted to say, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly am not meaning just kind of you know weep no. over Nick Griffin's media fate no, um, or, or express any sympathy for anything he said. No. I suppose really, really, really. We've been really ever wanted, so careful here. Yeah. Are. What I really wanted to get to was just, I kind of feel like you, if you step on something taboo, mm. certainly in, in UK media then it can be an absolute, I mean, David Starkey say, you know, it can absolutely blacken your name. But if you manage to just toe the right line of um, saying something that's just overtly horrific um, and tap into sort of general discontent and come across as plain speaking and down the pub, then you yes, get lots yes, of yes. popularity points, yes, it seems, from yes, people who are, right. 
who almost would want to say the worst yeah. stuff, but yeah. would you know, but but would tap, would, would you know endorse whatever kind of common taboo, which I think is a very useful taboo there yeah. is for saying them, and it's a bit kind of negative to say, well, you know, I mean, maybe we only avoid saying some, you know, maybe many people only avoid saying some things because it is just taboo rather than because they actually think them. But I mean, it seems to me that you know, like on the one side, you you know you you get torpedoed if you say some things on the other side provided you kind of say things which imply to people who would like to say the horrific things that you're on their side you actually get a popularity boost i don't know if that's true if you do you know if you um, PC is good i mean to, to, i think to, sort of tonally again is a, you know sort of the, something that we learn through performance i mean one of the things about trump is he's a performer um, and so tonally, he this sort of bombastic pantomime presence, which gives the impression, which I think is probably tied to the truth, that he really doesn't care. People find it enormously appealing. Well, they don't like the sort of politicians who feel that they really care about their own power. That sort of makes them, in a, in a way, sort of feel weak and unleaderly. But also, you know, sort of Trump put... Uh, I mean, the, the interesting thing is just how it shifted the... Um, I mean, this is where I do sort of, again, struggle with it, which is that he shifted the bounds of acceptable debate definitely further right for something like immigration, which wasn't really being sort of, it wasn't really front and centre of the, of the debate, and it allowed for a sort of an extremity of language to enter the debate. And you could say, well, that's a really good thing. I don't think that sort of some of the things that are being said would be at all beneficial to America uh, if they were then implemented, actually, if there were policies that were implemented. But it's a, but it's a kind of an interesting thing. It's just that, like the bounds of acceptability is a really interesting issue. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, Richard Danbury. Um, uh, I've got an anecdote uh, 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 and a point. The anecdote is a Griffin anecdote. Um, and it's, uh, I used to work on Newsnight, and um, I, I think, was one of the first people to put him on national TV. And we had enormous angst about whether to put him on national TV, and we got a lot of um, we got a lot of criticism afterwards for doing so. Our justification for doing so was to give him an opportunity of making a fool of himself, uh, and to prepare a very coruscating interview. And surprisingly, he did very well, and we weren't able to um, uh, uh, land as many punches as we want. So that leads to the point, which is sometimes um, the 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 uh, in the answer to, to, to dangerous speech, sometimes the idea that there should be counter speech and more speech, sometimes that, that's actually dangerous and it doesn't work. And it, as a journalist, it gives you an acute difficulty, which is what you're saying, Emily, um, of whether to cover it or not. Um, and the second observation was that I think there are distinctions in, in this question about where the balance of speech um, and banning speech lies. In, in, obviously, in America and in the UK, we're very much more, and in Europe, very much more relaxed about banning speech, particularly hate speech. And in America, they're much more phlegmatic about it. So I think there are cultural differences, which, of course, the internet elides. Well, also, I mean, the interesting thing about America is that it thinks it's actually the home of free speech and the First Amendment is a very wonderful thing. America is an enormously conservative um, culture, you know, and it's, I have to keep reminding myself, it's founded by Puritans because they don't like, they don't like to drink at lunchtime. They don't really prove anyone smoking. Um, they really wish that I would spend more time in the gym. You know, they are not, they are kind of, they are not people who, and, and discourse is incredibly self-censored. Nobody swears in America. Like if you, if we sat up here and said, it's fucking ridiculous, it would be on the front page, <laughs> almost on the front page of the New York Times tomorrow. I mean, you know, in that, so, 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 so there are, you know, there, there are kind of, so, so freedom of speech is, is manifest in all sorts of ways. And, and, yes. and the first amendment is, is one protection. Um, but there are things, you know, you, I, I think in some ways, sort of Europe, you hear much more frank and free discussion. You tend to hear polarised speech in America, and it tends to come from things like evangelical preachers, and it's very sort of declarative. But in normal day-to-day -day conversation, people are self-censor in a way that they don't, I would say that they, 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 my experience has been that they don't hear. And it's, a very, it's an interesting thing because then working out what it means to control. You know, we are, one of the things about social media is it is imposing the American standard of free speech on the rest of the world. 
You know, it's like sort of the central terms of use for Facebook or for Twitter become really the default yeah. standards of speech for everywhere. Yeah. But it's, it's also the case that um, the slogan of freedom of speech has become the slogan of the, the Twitter abusers and insulters. You know, if you, if you say, someone writes, you know, I think that your vagina smells for cabbage or whatever, you know, as they do, um, you say, I think it'd be a good idea to take that down. Hmm. You know, now, obviously, you, you use a very moderate form of phrasing, which, of course, as they spot, instantly gives you the moral high ground. You know, they, they've said your vagina smells of cabbage, and you say, I think it'd be a very good idea if you took that tweet down. Um, and already there's a, a yes. clash between different yes. power systems here. But what will then come back? Oh, I've got a right. You know, are you trying to stop my freedom of speech? I have a right to my opinion. I've got a right to my opinion. I've got a right. And it is, uh, particularly in 140 characters, it is very hard to say, you know, that this is not something, you know, there is no universal right to freedom of speech. We know that. There never has been, you know. Right. You know, you 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 do not have a right to, you know, never mind modern issues of, uh, uh, racism, etc. You don't have a right to say, let's all go off and kill, um, you know, X who yes. you don't like. You do not have a right to incite. Yes. Um, and uh, and yet, the declaratory medium of of most platforms of social media mean that freedom of speech is something that uh, that is constantly appealed to in an extremely uninteresting way. Or very you know, damaging, I think. Yes, and no, I think that's right. And I think actually what's interesting about the First Amendment is you're now seeing, for instance, companies in America using free, sort of the First Amendment to say some particularly sort of vile thing that they're doing. Well, this is speech. We should be protected yeah. as speakers. A company yeah, can be a speaker. Yeah. So, um, and, and I think that sort of, you know, the redrawings, how we redraw this, it is really fascinating. It is fascinating that Mark Zuckerberg will say, you should not be allowed to have I'm not going to let people advertise guns, which we all agree with on Facebook. That's, you know, kind of a, that's a, that's a ban we can all get behind. Um, we're not going to allow people to pay, post hate speech about refugees in Germany. Okay, fair enough. We also, yeah. all, all, you know, yeah. all agree with that. We're not going to allow ISIS to have accounts or um, people to, who support ISIS to discuss it. That's also fine. But there will be a point at which those edge cases become uncomfortable for us. It could be, well, I'm not going to allow people to criticise Facebook. This is my... And, and if it's the default yeah. public sphere... So that's the thing that bothers me, in a way. Yeah, and it's, is, it's also... I mean, there's, there's a kind of wider set of issues in which, you know, unfashionable as it might be, you know, there are some conflicts and tensions yeah. within any culture that is probably useful for the culture not always to examine. You know, yes. silence, not picking the saw, can be the right thing to do, you know, rather than constantly to believe that getting to the bottom of this and having the argument about it. You know, <laughs> maybe we just occasionally just shut the fuck up on something. You see, I think that's great. I think it's a very good British uh, way of thinking about it, which is that there's a lot to be said for being really quiet yep. and, and just having have... a stiff upper lip. Yep. Not sharing your feelings right. on a subject. My husband, not, is, my not, husband is very British, is always saying, I think actually bottling it up is massively it's underrated. It's, it's, that's right. I think that I would, you know, I'm not very good at bottling it up, but I know it's a virtue that I would, to which I aspire. No, I, no, I was going to say, I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm a great expounder. He's a great bottler. It's like it's one of the great strengths of our marriage is the fact that he's just like, yes, dear, that's, yes, you're right. They're all crazy. And yes, you're, that's right. Um, but it's so, but holding no, it all in, don't so, talk about it to everybody. And selective blindness is what most cultures rest on. Now, occasionally it's very good to unseat that selective blindness because it turns out we've been blind to things that we would rather not be blind to. But it's not necessarily bad not to see everything. But also just like sort of like, education ought to have a role in this. Just like, so just as you were taught to write a telegram. Um, which I still think is one I'd love to have been in that lesson. Um, uh, <laughs> if I were to tell you what the telegram, the, the, what the theme was, you'll say exactly the kind of academic girls' school I went to, because the telegram we had to write was one offering us a scholarship at Cambridge. Oh, 
Oh my goodness me. <laughs> it's like a social, that's a social. Talk point. about, you know, the replication of culture. Wasn't that wonderful? That's one that's one that's scholarship Cambridge wire to accept. That's, <laughs> that's, social, that is, very that's, good. that's social conditioning. Amazing, isn't it? It's, that it's is amazing. amazing. It's like learning Latin. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Nora, Nila, John. Um, I'm not surprised at all that freedom of speech has come up a lot this evening at the talk, and I think very rightly. But um, you brought this point up yesterday, Emily, and rather than focus on the freedom of speech, what comes to mind for me about the dangers, for example, for social media and journalism and free speech is the immediacy of speech, that now we have a culture where people don't even think before they post things. And Emily gave the example yesterday about somebody posted was it a photograph or footage of one of the um, yes, yes, so, so, somebody, yes, yeah, somebody had um, a, a guy called Geordie Meir, who is an engineer who has a flat which was around the corner from the um, Charlie Hebdo offices, actually filmed the. Mm -hmm two uh, gunmen shooting the uh, policeman dead on the pavement and posted it to Facebook. And uh, as I was saying yesterday, the problem was that he wanted to change his mind about it for reasons of all sorts of reasons. And he wasn't allowed to because, of course, by that time it had gone and it was everywhere uh, and there was no deletion and retrieval. And as a journalist, again, actually what I didn't say last night, but as a journalist that's very difficult because part of you thinks, it's a really important piece of our, you know, piece of news video and then piece of archival video. And should he actually have the right to say, I don't want anyone else to see that now? I mean, you know, it's a kind of, there is a balance there about public interest versus ability to, but your point about speed, I think. I mean, so and this is following on, I suppose, yeah. quite nicely from the point you just raised about um, learning how to write a, a telegram and in terms of what people should be taught now, like learning how to what the appropriate thing is to tweet or what the appropriate thing is to put on a particular platform. But I think, you know, in that realm of education, an important point would be reflection. Step back. What are the consequences of this? And I take your point, Mary, about the norms of society stepping in and everyone saying, oh, well, you know, we all had those crazy photographs, but sometimes it's not so frivolous. I mean, sometimes no. people say no. things when they're a teenager, no. No. definitely no. said my share, that, you know, after you know but, a second a second moment, I would have thought, oh, well, that was stupid, that was silly, but could so easily be taken out of no, context. No. I, 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 you know, I agree, but I don't see any effective form of policing other than us actually coming together mm. to see that what somebody said twenty years mm. ago is just not going to count. And mm. I mean, I think you know Emma's example is an important one, but actually, when most people put something ill-advised yeah, on social media. It is not going viral and it is no. not, you know. So, you know, for most of us, we're not going to be in that position. No, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And we, you know, I, I think it's absolutely inevitable, you know, what people say can be ill-advised, what people, because anything that you do quickly can always be ill-advised. You can be ill-advised when you do it slowly, but it's easier to be ill-advised when you're quick. Um, and there have been, you know, I, I can't imagine that anybody who's on Twitter in this room, I can't think of several tweets that they've done late at night, possibly after slightly more drink than they should have had, <laughs> which they sort of think in the morning, I'll think oh, I'll perhaps delete that one. Yes. Um, and we have to find a way of managing that, it seems to me, but also drawing a distinction. And I think that actually we, we're not going to be bad at this. It's a bit early, but we're not going to be bad between you know, a really stupid mm. thing to say when you're disinhibited mm. or when you didn't think and uh, actually a campaign of vitriol and hatred. We all yes. know what the difference is, really. Yes, yes, I think that, no, I think that's absolutely right. But the, I mean, when, when I'm teaching journalism students now, I say, when I was, you know, when I was your age, uh, which I do like to point out, it was not 100 years ago. I am only 50, not 150. But when I get into, you know, the tools of my trade were a telephone that actually was kind of get, went into the ground with a curly wire attached to it, and that if you wanted to research anything, you had to go down into the bowels of the building in which you worked, and somebody would give you a folder 
which contained cut up bits of the newspaper that you worked at, yes. probably with your own stories on, uh, which would be your research. Um, and then if you wanted to find anything else out about it, you either had to go to a library or to the company's house, and you had to ring up like 20 people a day to get any level. And I say, you, so, so actually now you have all of those tools. Yes. But you also used to make mistakes back then. But you used then. to make, yeah, you used and, to make and mistakes so, no, and what, you made wrong judgment what, no, calls. One of my students said, how did you ever publish anything and, what, and how was it ever right? And I said, well, A, we didn't publish very much, and B, actually it was quite often wrong. Yeah. And I said, now you have all of these fantastic tools. My job is to teach you to think critically at speed about what it means to be publishing in a social sphere um, and what it means to be a journalist in particular, what that sort of, you know, kind of what, 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 that, what that identity carries with it and how does that feed into your reporting? How does it sort of feed into how you relate your stories to the rest of the world? Um, and it is a lot about, I think, reflection is a really yeah. good way of putting and it. The but. problems can figure differently, but they're not, they're not in essence uh, qualitatively different. I mean, there's, there have always been debates about um, you know, what kind of war picture, or in my lifetime there's always been debates about what kind of war photograph you have on yes. the front cover, you know, Don McCullen, you know, and on. And uh, that it, it, it feels different yes. when it's so quick and it feels different when it, you know, when in a sense you know that it's gone to, it's been retweeted, you know, 5,000 yes. times within yes. the first hour. It does feel different, yes. but the, the basic moral dilemmas are not different. No, I think, that's absolutely, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, but we have to keep sort of, we, we never stop. I think one of our, one of the mistakes that we're all prone to a little bit is thinking, well, we've had that debate, we don't need to have it again. And so, so one of the things is just that, yeah, the, the re-education yeah. sort of is, a, is an ongoing you process. Know, every generation has to, you know, sit in their class and do the equivalent, whatever it is, of writing a telegram. And, yes. you know, have to learn all these. And we, you know, it is, you know, it's a work in progress. We've never got it sorted out. You know, and what we dis decide to be blind about, what we decide to be insulting about, the, you, know, you know, there isn't, there just ain't no right answer. And I... And I think that no. well, we hate not having right answers. Yeah, yeah. We and that's hate it. One of the kind of anxieties that I feel caught between, uh, on the one hand, between you know these you know complete idiots who say, "Well, it's my right to speak. I've got freedom of speech to say this," and the others who say, "I want a safe space." You know, and actually, there are two sides of a spectrum in which how we position ourselves is actually very hard. Just to finish very quickly on that, that I completely take the point about education, definitely. Um, providing a role to address that um, and in terms of you know having to police it you know I definitely take the point that you know there are definitely problems but to kind of step back and take this position that well that's just the way it is that's the internet it just retains everything and everyone will access everything I feel like we're feeding in to that yeah. culture that you brought up Emily about these are the norms from Silicon Valley this is the freedom yeah. of speech uh, North American culture, yeah. whereas, you know, in Europe, there has been some pushback mm. in recent years, like the right to be forgotten with Google, like yes. nobody, you know, in Silicon Valley saw that one coming. So, but it does represent, you know, this other pushback, other norms, like not just mm. education mm. and gradual incremental change within mm. the community, but more immediate pushes back against that kind of environment. Well, I think, I, so I think one of the things about this is that um, America is and I don't mean this sort of in an insulting way to my American colleagues and friends, um, but until you live there for a period of time, and I sort of Mary's lived there for a while as well, you don't realise really what being in a capital, genuinely capitalist society means. And the market, you know, the market is right. In America, the market is right and the government is wrong. And that's the sort of the default position yeah. of society. That, and they fought wars about it. You know, they really did. And so, so whereas I think your, your point about your two things, we've had far more sort of conflict in... Uh, uh, and we've had it among people who live very close together than so America has had. Uh, and so there's been a necessity, sort of political necessity for it. Um, but also, you know, the, in terms of how Silicon Valley go about thinking about these things, right until now, and we're talking about four or five of the biggest companies, not just in America, but in the world now, uh, that the, you know, and some of those companies go into a trillion dollars in sort of valuation. That's a sort of, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a 
you know, there, there was a meme that says I was just sort of carry on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but it hasn't been a business problem. So actually, what's interesting about Twitter is that, you know, kind of the sort of very, um, uh, you know, the robustness of the, or, or, the, or the sort of the, 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 the kind of the type of, sort of discourse it's, it's built up has become problematic because mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of the troll factory means that it's costing it money that advertisers don't really want to stand next to the stuff that's on Twitter, partly because some of the stuff on Twitter is, is news and nobody wants to stand next to news. This is why journalism is, is, is kind of uneconomic. Um, and now it's a business problem. There's much more discussion about yeah. this, what right. can we what can we actually do about it. And I think that that's why you, so Europe is is the most progressive place, just in terms of thinking about how policy feeds into this, because we would always include that in the debate. Whereas in America, it's like the market will fix it, and what the market doesn't fix actually is is culture and community. Often, it's like you do need interventions and. You know, there, there hasn't been a mechanism. Now I think we'll see a different different type of conversation. And interventions are usually in the interests of the prominent Twitter um, victims, however. That's so that, right. You know, yes, again, yes. It replicates because, yes. you know, the, the, uh, those that we don't see well, don't have the access to. Yeah, it no, was absolutely. much easier. Look, yes. when, I got, when I got trolled, what did I do? You know, actually, it was before Twitter was good. I, you know, I got in touch with Women's Hour. Now, yes. You know, that, and that was a very privileged thing to do. It was a very yes. sensible thing yes. to do in my position. Um, but it was also yeah. precisely the point that I was trying to make, that I both was uh, differentially the victim, but I had all kinds of cultural uh, and social and political resources with which to... Right. to to handle it. And to some way, in, in some ways, actually, social media has amplified that. So there's yeah. another issue which says, you know, if you disappear off Twitter, um, and much more Twitter than Facebook, but I think it's increasingly going to be the case with Facebook as well, that you disappear from public life in a way that wouldn't have been the case yeah. before, that it becomes the sort of the filter for people to get into yeah. mainstream. Can I, can I suggest at that point that we all disappear from public life temporarily? <laughs> um, I want to thank you both very much for, for, for this uh, conversation. And I'd like to say that for anybody who's interested in following up the policy and other implications of this, th there is a, a symposium tomorrow in the afternoon in Crash, and you'd be very welcome to come. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to our... Thank you.